Hello and welcome to today's session. What is the best state to incorporate in? I'm Anita Campbell and I'm your host. And in just a moment, you're going to meet our guest speaker who is a fantastically um, uh, wonderful person who uh, understands this area inside and out. So, this is brought to you by Small Business Trends and CorpNet. Let me cover just a couple of housekeeping details. The session will be one hour, and that includes 50 minutes of presentation materials. And we're going to go very fast because there's a lot of information here. And then we'll have 10 minutes at the end for question and answer. So if you are on Zoom and joining us from Zoom, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little uh, panel that shows up there and it has Q&A. So put your questions in there, type them in there. You can type them throughout the session and we'll get to them. If we can get to some of them during the session, we will, but we'll get to them at the end, as many as we can. And if you're on Facebook, uh, watching, uh, please just type them into the uh, event on Facebook and we'll try to monitor and get them there as well. Uh, we have a special offer near the end, so please stay tuned. It's great discount. All right, so that's me, Anita Campbell. Uh, I'm the CEO of Small Business Trends Media. I started the company back in 2003. I can barely uh, believe it. And our special guest today, our very talented person, is Nellie Akelp. She is the CEO and co-founder of CorpNet. So let's take a look at Nellie's bio. So Nellie is an entrepreneur. She is a business expert, a published author. And I would say this, she is one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer in the area of online incorporation services. She started this back when nobody else had the vision for it, but Nellie did. And I met Nellie at an event a few years back and we got to talking and she told me how she started the business and, and um, she actually sold her first company to a very large corporation. And then later on, after a while, she got back into the industry again. I guess she just couldn't stay away. Uh, and I'm glad she did because she's so talented. She has so much to offer and she shares her knowledge freely. So with that, I would like to introduce Nellie Akelp and Nellie, take it away. today is to understand the option to decide in which state uh, you should uh, register your business in and alternatively if you have clients um, who you're coaching or advising what states your clients should register your business in. Um, we're going to briefly cover the following points so you can have a roadmap as to how we're going to uh, plan on going through this webinar. We're going to briefly discuss the importance of business incorporation, provide all of you with a quick business entity refresher course. Um, we're going to talk about the considerations when it comes to selecting a state to incorporate your business in. We're going to uh, look at all the different options available to you. We're also going to uh, take a moment and talk about doing business in other states that also refer to as foreign qualifying in another state. This really comes into play when you have an existing corporation or LLC and um, it's time to expand the business into other states. We're also going to be talking about moving your business from one state to another, also referred to as business uh, redomestication or redomiciling into a new state. And then we're going to talk about tools and resources and other available great features available to you. And as Anita mentioned, the um, special offer that is available to all of you attending this webinar through Small Business Trends. So with that said, let's talk about the importance of business incorporation main benefit of incorporating a business, it really boils down to liability protection of personal assets. By default, when you're operating your business as 
a uh, sole proprietor or general partnership, you are the business. Um, by default, when somebody starts a business without incorporating or forming an LLC, by default, that business is coined as a sole proprietorship if that business is operated by one person. And if the business is being operated by two or more people, then it's by default coined as a general partnership. Um, a sole proprietorship or general partnership has literally no corporate shield, no corporate veil. There is no liability or um, asset protection available to the owners of that proprietorship. A proprietor is really the business owner, the person, you know, operating the business for profit. So as a sole proprietor or a partnership, there is no liability protection or uh, protection of those personal assets. So God forbid, if that business is sued, you, the proprietor of that business, is liable for anything that they claim a judgment against, whether it's your house, your car, savings account, um, retirement account. So business or forming an LLC comes in. And one of the biggest advantages of incorporating or placing in, uh, your business into an LLC is that you get that liability protection um, against any type of personal liability as a business owner and also protection against your personal assets so that, God forbid, if that corporation or LLC is sued, they can go only after whatever is in that corporation or LLC or whatever that corporation or LLC has as assets um, to their to that extent. They cannot come after the owners um, or shareholders or members of that corporation or LLC personally. Other benefits of incorporating, obviously, as a corporation or LLC, you are a separate legal entity. Uh, as a corporation or LLC, that corporation or LLC is a natural person on its own. It's a natural separate legal entity on its own, separate from its owners. You will uh, receive added credibility by adding that INC or LLC to the end of that business. Name, you're likely to be looked upon by people who are dealing with you as a more established entity. They view you as a more legalized, established entity by taking the necessary steps to legalize yourself. So ultimately, they're going to view you as more of an established entity, and they're likely wanting to do business with you. With a corporation or LLC, there's also perpetual existence, whereby as a corporation or LLC, the corporation or LLC continues on and on unless it's formally closed down or dissolved. Um, whereas with a sole proprietorship or a partnership, um, once the proprietor dies, the business dies with that proprietor or partnership. There's also tax flexibility. And um, oftentimes you're able to deduct more expenses um, by operating a business as a corporation or LLC. With that said, we want to go in to giving you guys a brief business entity refresher course. For those of you who were in prior webinars that Anita and I have presented, we've done we've gone through more extensive detail um, through the different types of business entities. So uh, we're just going to do a quick refresher here for any of you who didn't um, and weren't available to attend those previous webinars, and um, they're always available for you to access as well. Uh, starting with the sole proprietorship partnership, as I mentioned to uh, sole proprietorship partnership is basically one person or two or more people setting up a business. You can set up shop, you can start accepting payments for the services you offer. You can start accepting those services um, where checks um, are made payable directly to you. Or if you want, you can set up a fictitious business name whereby you as the business owner are doing business under a fictitious name. And if you wanted to do that, you would file a doing business as filing or a fictitious business name filing with in the county recorder's office of the county where your business is located. Um, this would be the exact same steps you would take as a partnership as well, where you're operating the business with two or more people. With this type of entity, it's really simple to form and maintain. It's very simple to tax. Basically, any um, profits that you make are 
uh, you know, you're, you're paying self-employment taxes on it, and it's taxed on the Schedule C of your personal income tax return. However, keep in mind with this type of entity, although it's simple to form and maintain, there's no separation of your personal and business assets. You are the business, and um, whatever the business is liable for, you are you know, liable as well. And there's no separate identity under the law. As such, with this type of business entity, you really can't gain business credit or take out business loans or raise capital in other ways. And again, there is no separation of your assets. God forbid, if someone gets a judgment against you or sues you, you are personally liable because there is no liability protection against your personal assets. Moving on to the corporation, the corporation now brings us to the separate legal entity land, where now you are creating this formal business structure where it really creates this bubble around you as a business owner. The corporation is the most formal type of entity out there. It's owned by shareholders and run by uh, run by an elected board of directors who in turn uh, elect officers who run the day-to-day -day operations of that corporation. Again, a corporation is a natural legal entity on its own. So when that corporation is formed, uh, you have to obtain a tax ID number for that corporation. And that tax ID number is... Um, the way the IRS will, you know, identify the transactions of that corporation. So when a corporation comes into life, it's like giving birth to a child. That corporation will need its own tax ID number, similar to when a human comes to life, they need a social security number. So with the C corporation, it's the most formal type of entity, which will give you the maximum type of liability and asset protection um, to its business owners. So think of you as the business owner inside a bubble, you're shielded from any type of personal liability and your assets are protected. So God forbid, if that corporation is sued, they can't come after you personally, they can go after uh, to the extent that the corporation has assets within it, as long as, as long as the corporation is being complied with in accordance with the state laws of that state. Um, with a C corporation, um, a typical C corporation can be subject to double taxation, meaning that um, once the corporation reports any type of income or profits, the corporation is taxed at the corporate level. And then once the corporation pays out a distribution to each of the shareholders of that corporation that are often referred to as the owners of that corporation, the shareholders of that corporation are again taxed again at their individual rates according to that state's tax rates. Hence, thereby the whole idea of double taxation. As such, a C corporation is really not ideal for a small business who wants to reinvest their profits into the business and who wants to be active um, in the business. A C corp is often ideal for um, a business who really has an exit strategy from the get-go or wants to go public or wants to seek venture capital uh, funding from day one. Again, we don't recommend this type of business for a small business owner who's just starting out. Moving on to the S corporation. Now, a lot of you, and there's this misnomer that an S corporation is its own type of a business entity. An S corporation is not a type of corporation. It's a tax designation that's given to a C corporation. A C, basically with an S corporation, it's really a C corporation whereby that C corporation has met the IRS requirements to elect S corporation status for that corporation so that in the eyes of the IRS, that corporation is viewed as a pass-through tax entity and it's viewed as an S corp designation status for tax status. So how does one become an S corporation and why does one want to elect S corporation status? Let's hit that question number two first. Why does one want to elect S corporation status? Well, it's simple. As I mentioned to you with a C corporation, a C corp typically is subject to double taxation. So if the shareholders of a C corporation meet the requirements of the S corporation, 
guidelines as delineated by the IRS, they can avoid this double taxation that's often associated with a C-Corp and have that C-Corp now in the eyes of the IRS be viewed as a pass-through tax entity by electing S-Corporation status. By being an S-Corporation, that C-Corporation is now a pass-through tax entity where all the profits and losses are now flown through and just reported once at the shareholder individual level. Again, Again, this is great for a small business owner who wants to be active within the corporation, who meets the requirements of the S-Corp election, and wants to reinvest the profits into the business. Um, there are strict requirements that have to be um, met before a C-Corp can elect as corporation status. Those requirements are that there can only be up to 100 shareholders within the corporation. There can only be one type of stock. Um, all the shareholders must be citizens and or residents of the US and that election has to be made within 75 business days of the corporation coming into existence, issuing out shares or um, starting to do business, whichever happens earlier. If you miss that 75 business day deadline, there are situations where the IRS will make an exception and grant relief. However, if there is no relief available, uh, don't worry, there's still time and you can make that election for the following tax year on or before March 15th of the following tax year to be effective for that following tax year. But at the end of the day, with an S corporation, it's really designed to um, make that C corporation a pass through tax entity in the eyes of the IRS so that the shareholders get prevented by being taxed um, both at the corporate level and at the individual level. In all other aspects, um, it is still a C corporation and there are compliance maintenance requirements and annual requirements, uh, annual compliance requirements that must be abided by as with any normal C corporation. Uh, Nelly, um, let me interject. We've had a question here and you may have alluded to this, but <clears throat> I wonder if you could address it. Um, limited liability company. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard that a limited liability company can be an S corp, can, can make that S corp election. Is that yes. true? And if so, why would you do that? Great question. And we are actually on the slide for LLC. So I will hit that one in one second for you. Um, but in answer to your question, Anita, and absolutely an LLC can elect the S-corporation election. And typically why an LLC would want to do that is because um, they want the foundation of the business entity to be an LLC so that they don't have to comply with heavy complex formalities as often would afford, be afforded with, with a corporation, but they still want the members of that LLC want to place themselves on payroll and take a paycheck out of the LLC um, versus taking a draw out of the LLC and, and having to pay higher self-employment taxes. So that's really the gist of it, but I'll go into it in more detail um, and it'll be within the following slides. So let's talk about the LLC. This is how I like to characterize the LLC. Uh, the LLC, I refer to this entity as you get to have your cake and eat it too. Why? Because the LLC combines elements of a sole proprietorship partnership along with elements of the corporation. So really what the LLC does is you get to have all the liability protection and asset protection that's normally afforded to you by uh, from a corporation without all the formalities. There are no formalities when you're running a limited liability company, um, with the exception of one uh, document, which is the LLC operating agreement, which controls the LLC and how each of the members of the LLC um, you know, have responsibilities towards one another and to the LLC, and then also annual compliance filing requirements with the state. But there are no really complex filing requirements and upkeeps and paperwork as you would normally have to deal with um, by having a, a corporation or an S corporation. 
Um, with an LLC, it really helps, again, shield owners from personal liability. And really, this is designed for the business owner who really wants that liability and asset protection, but without all the headache um, and paperwork that's often associated uh, in running a corporation. Um, also, it's very, very, very um, you know, very less complex to run and manage. Again, there's no annual meeting minutes. There's no um, drafting on any type of annual meeting minutes or holding annual meetings each year. Um, and, you know, you don't have to pass resolutions or, you know, uh, maintain bylaws. Everything is really, really delineated within that operating agreement. Now, um, with the LLC, as I mentioned to you, um, there is a lot of flexibility as to how the LLC can be taxed. By default, if it's a single member LLC, it's taxed as a, a sole proprietorship. Um, and if the LLC is a multi-member LLC, it's taxed as a partnership. As such, because there's elements of a proprietorship or a partnership associated with that LLC, members of an LLC cannot be employees of an LLC. As such, they can only take a draw out of the LLC. And as a result, because they're only taking a draw, they're subjected to higher self-employment taxes and they have to pay self-employment taxes on the draw they take out of the LLC. So a way to get around this is the LLC can elect to be uh, taxed as an S corporation to bypass having to pay these higher self-employment taxes. If the members of that LLC meet the S corporation election requirements, those members can elect S corporation status for that LLC. And uh, once that election is approved, the members of the LLC can now place themselves on payroll and take a reasonable uh, salary as a paycheck out of that LLC and um, avoid having to pay higher self-employment taxes, but still maintain the uh, you know, ease of having to run the foundation of that business as an LLC as opposed to a corporation and not having to deal with those complex formalities as often associated with a corporation. So, um, you know, if somebody really wants that minimal formality, they would opt to, you know, have the business uh, operated as an LLC. And if they meet the S Corp requirements, they would elect S Corp status place themselves on payroll and take a reasonable salary as a paycheck. Now, what happens if the members don't meet the requirements of the S Corp election? Well, you can elect to be taxed as a C Corp, which you know, for some of you, according to your individual tax rate, may be less costly because as a C Corp, you're taxed as a flat 21%. So if you don't meet the you know, requirements of the S corporation, you can opt to have that LLC taxed as a C corp, and again place yourself um, on payroll and take a reasonable salary out of that corporation by paycheck and bypass having to pay the higher self-employment taxes. If your self-employment tax bracket is higher at a at higher than twenty one percent that you would pay as a corporation. So again, lots of information here. And again, if you guys have any questions, please place it in the chat and I'd be, I'll do my best to answer as much as I can. Um, let's move on to considerations when selecting a state. Um, when we're talking about choosing a state to incorporate in, here's the bottom line. Um, there are many variables entrepreneurs should consider to find the lowest cost and best option for their situation. Um, some of the considerations that you want to think about is how much it is to file within that state, public information and online filings, taxes, the legal system, investor appeal. But here's the bottom line, and this is the general rule of thumb. If you're operating a business where you're located, the business is located, your employees are located, the general rule of thumb is to incorporate it within that state. Looking at other states is just going to hurt you even more and just subject you to multiple state laws and filing fees. And we'll go on and talk about that in more detail in a few slides here. So when we're talking about initial filing fees, when you're forming a corporation or LLC, you have to pay the state to form that corporation or LLC. And um, 
the filing fees for each state vary. Every state has different filing requirements and filing fees. Um, some states are less than $100. And some states can be up to several hundred dollars. Um, for example, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Texas, um, whereas for example, Arkansas and Colorado, they have filing fees to just bring a corporation into existence that are, you know, less than $100. Just because a state's business registration filing may be more than what some other state charges, it doesn't mean that establishing a business in that state will be expensive overall. The formation fee is just a one-time charge. Um, once you form a corporation or LLC, Keep in mind, there's also annual compliance filings that have to be maintained, and there's annual filing fees that you have to pay in order to keep that corporation or LLC into existence. For example, many states require filings and fees on an ongoing basis to keep that business in good standing, um, typically with what is called an annual report, okay, that is required for you to submit along, you know, <coughs> annually for that corporation or LLC, excuse me. Other times, um, you know, you may have changes within your corporation or LLC that um, may require you to file a change of, you know, information with the state. Um, maybe your LLC or corporation has gone into bad standing and you need to pay reinstatement fees. So there are oftentimes fees that are associated after the corporation or LLC is formed in order to keep the LLC or corporation in good standing. And then also, let's say it's come to a point where you want to close down the LLC or corporation. Again, there's a fee that you have to pay to close down that LLC. In addition to state franchise taxes and taxes that you may have to pay according to your state's laws and um, you know, regulations. Um, another thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the state that you want to form the corporation or LLC in is, you know, um, the accessibility to information publicly. As you can see, you know, we've listed out here some of the states that are kind of more of the hype states. Uh, for example, Florida, you know, formation documents and annual reports are always available online publicly. You know, um, and then you can see the differences between Delaware, Wyoming, and Nevada. For example, Nevada is a big state that a lot of people want to, you know, incorporate in. There is no agreement with the IRS in the state of Nevada to share financial information. And for example, Wyoming allows identity protection with lifetime proxies. And Delaware limits reporting and disclosing requirements, allowing business owners to maintain their anonymity. So if you know, you're know you really big on anonymity, Delaware is a great state to set up that corporation or LLC in. However, again, if your business is not located in Delaware, then you're going to set up in Delaware and then the state that you're located in is going to require you to file within that state as well. So you got to be really careful when it comes to selecting the state that you want to set up that corporation or LLC in. Let's talk about state corporate taxes. Some states levy no income tax. We've listed the states out here for you. For example, Nevada is another big one, Wyoming. And some states also have no personal income tax. Again, Nevada and Wyoming are two states that they don't levy any income tax or any type of personal income tax. Companies that operate in these tax-friendly states and in other states will still need to pay income tax and other applicable taxes as required by, you know, their state, you know. So, for example, if a business is physically located and operating in California, they, they have to pay California income taxes if it's incorporated in Nevada. So let's say, you know, you're set up as a Nevada corporation, but your business is physically located and you're operating in California. California is not only going to require you to form qualify that Nevada corporation as a California entity, but California is also going to require you to pay income taxes, even if you're incorporated in the state of Nevada. Um, franchise taxes is another one. Um, uh, you got to take into consideration as to whether your uh, state will require you to pay a franchise tax. For example, um, I live in California and as a corporation, we have an annual minimum franchise tax of $800 that we have to pay each year. 
Um, typically, annual franchise taxes are based on a business's income, even if a business is losing money. And that minimum, for example, in California is $800 a year. Uh, for example, in Delaware, the franchise tax is based on the number of shares and par value that corporation authorizes that to issue. And Wyoming and Nevada do not even impose a franchise tax. So it's really important for you to educate yourselves on um, all the tax implications when you're ready to set up that corporation or LLC. Legal system is another really big one is you definitely want to make sure what you're, you know, going up against, you know, legally, if you're setting up your corporation or LLC within a uh, state, you want to make sure what the legal system and what um, sort of legal measures are available to you. For example, some states such as Delaware have a business friendly legal system. Um, you know, cases get resolved quicker than other states um, than other states, you know, so you definitely, definitely want to make sure that, you know, the legal system in the state that you're planning on operating your business in is advantageous for you and your business. Um, investor appeal is another one. If you're, um, you know, thinking about operating a business whereby from the get-go, you're looking for investors or venture capital. For example, um, Delaware is a big one. You know, um, typically businesses who are trying to raise funding and venture capital, they opt for setting up in the state of Delaware because this is um, simply more familiar and, you know, the investor appeal is really high when they look at a corporation or LLC being set up in Delaware. Um, some of the business friendly states that I want to, you know, go over with you, um, if business owners want the best possible tax setup without many burdens or regulations, but you don't want to relocate the ability to incorporate in one state and live in another can be a huge help. So while each state is really different, some states simply stand out as good choices for incorporation. And again, the, the, those states are Delaware, Wyoming, and Nevada. These are ideal um, chooses because um, their business-friendly rules enhance privacy and their you know, friendly court systems really is what lends itself um, to these states being, you know, business friendly says, in addition to the fact that with Nevada and Wyoming, there is no uh, taxes, both um, state and uh, income taxes levied. So um, again, but remember, you have to talk to your financial advisor because um, typically when you're forming in these states and you're operating the business in another state, that state that you're operating in is going to subject you to those states laws and taxes as well. Um, Delaware is a huge one, you know, as I mentioned to you, um, with the state of Delaware, there's a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of privacy, um, Delaware uses judges instead of juries, which tends to be more favorable for business owners. Um, many investors and banks now show strong preference for Delaware corporations when you're going in to, you know, attract investors or trying to establish business credit. And then, also taxes as well, um, business friendly tax laws in Delaware. Um, here are the drawbacks with Delaware. It's not ideal for a small business. Most benefits um, when it comes to Delaware is for larger type corporations. And then also if you're a small business incorporating in Delaware will likely cause you um, multiple filings and additional expenses because you're going to have to also form qualify in your home state that you're actually operating the business in. Um, Wyoming is another great state. Um, here are, are the benefits with Wyoming. There's a lot of flexibility um, in operating your corporation or LLC in Wyoming. Um, in Wyoming, your clients have several options to run their businesses. Um, when incorporation paperwork is filed, individuals who will be running the day-to-day -day operations will have to be identified. Also, there's a lot of business incentives with Wyoming. Wyoming offers several incentives to businesses that wish to incorporate there. There's no corporate state income tax or franchise tax for corporations, and annual report filings remain really low. Um, however, again, the drawbacks are there are fewer benefits for remote businesses. So if your client wishes to incorporate in Wyoming and live elsewhere, they may not reap many of the benefits from being in state rather than operating out of state. 
Nevada is one of the most favorite states, but also one of those states where, you know, people kind of look at you going, okay, is this really a legit company, you know? Um, a corporation can be formed in Nevada, even if you do not live there. Um, Nevada has no state taxes for all types of taxes, not just corporate income tax. If a business is incorporated in Nevada, your client will not have to pay typical state levy taxes, such as corporate income tax, unitary tax, state tax, gift tax, personal income tax, franchise tax um, on income and admission tax. Nevada does not require owners to list names in order to incorporate. So there's a lot of privacy. Clients and or investors can remain anonymous. And then when a business is incorporated in Nevada, any liability the business incurs stays within the company. So lots of asset protection. But again, there's some drawbacks here. So um, one of the states that has really, really high incorporation fees is Nevada. Nevada has really high fees to get set up in the state of Nevada uh, compared to the other states. And also now Nevada requires a business license to renew the corporate status. So not only the state fees are high to set up, but there's also higher state fees to maintain the uh, corporation or LLC in the state of Nevada. And then there's this whole stigma associated with being a Nevada corporation or LLC in that some may see that corporation formed in Nevada as operated and operated elsewhere as illicit or having some type of illegitimate goal. So again, at the end of the day, consult your financial advisor, your accountant, your CPA as to which the best state is for you to set up your business in. And when you're looking at weighing your options as to being, uh, you know, setting up, home, you know, in your home state versus out of state, really, if a business is small, the benefits of, of incorporating in another state uh, will really be outweighed of the extra costs and the administration work created. So that's why general rule of thumb is to incorporate in the state that you're actually operating in, physically located in, where your storefront is, when your employees are, where your shareholders are located, where the servers of your business are, where the business bank account is, you want to incorporate in that state. And uh, really a business with fewer than five shareholders will not benefit by incorporating in any other state other than their home state. You're really just doubling up with the paperwork and administration for running a business in a state other than your home state. And if the majority of the business activity will be conducted in your home state, then it's best to incorporate it within your state, um, within your home state. So um, if the business operates in states other than the state of formation, then ultimately the state that you're actually operating in versus the state that you're actually incorporated in will require you to file for and qualification within those states. And again, that's gonna be more filing fees, more paperwork, more tax filings for you as a business owner that you'll have to comply with. Um, let's talk about foreign qualification quickly. Um, again, I bring this slide in because some of you listening in may already be a corporation or LLC and that corporation or LLC, when you're ready to you know, start expanding that business into other states and if you have employees within other states, then oftentimes that corporation or LLC will have to form qualify within those states that you're planning to conduct business in. Let's say you're a corporation in California and now you're starting to have employees in Arizona or Alaska or you're charging a tax for your services in Alaska or Arizona, well, that corporation in California now has to form qualify and uh, qualify to do business in those states to be in compliance within, uh, you know, with the state laws and also to continue extending that corporate veil from the corporation that's in essence in effect in uh, California to those other states so you can have that liability protection. Again, foreign qualification is basically having the authority to do business for your corporation in other states other than your home state. Um, and we've listed kind of some of the different scenarios here as to when a business may need to form qualify for a variety of reasons. Here's some examples for you. Again, these slides will be available to you um, 
in the chat notes, um, but for interest of time, um, I, I'm going to pass through these and go on to the next slide. Um, when is a foreign qualification needed? Again, to help you determine if you need to file for a foreign qualification once that corporation or LLC is established, um, again, foreign qualification is a second step. And it's when that corporation or LLC wants to expand into other states other than where the corporation or LLC is formally set up as their home state. These are some of the questions that you want to ask yourself to see if it lends to you, you know, needing to form qualify. For example, do you have physical presence in that new state? Do you, did you, you know, are you needing to require to file for a business license? Do you often conduct face-to-face -face meetings in that new state? Are any of your employees working in those states? Does a substantial chunk of your company's revenue come from that state? Are you charging a sales tax? Do you have a bank account? So those are all the questions that if you answer yes to the majority of them, then it lends itself to you needing to form qualify within those states. Um, when is foreign qualification not needed? It's basically where there's no nexus within the states. Um, so just because money is being made in another state doesn't mean you're transacting business there. Another um, simple one is if you're simply having employees within another state, most states don't require you to form qualify just because you have employees in another state. So again, check with your accountant, financial advisor, and they can provide you with um, you know, the appropriate information based on your particular situation. Um, how to form qualify again, you can come to a reputable company such as CorpNet that can help you with all of the paperwork in all of the 50 states. Um, if you've determined that you do need to form qualify again, you have to file documents with the state and pay a filing fee and make sure that you're in compliance within those states that you're also form qualified with and a reputable filing company such as our company CorpNet can assist you with all of this and more throughout the lifetime of the business. Um, if a business needs to form qualify but chooses not to um, and you, you start operating in any other state um, other than the home state of the corporation, you will likely have to pay penalties and you will be fined. Um, so definitely, definitely make sure you have all your, you know, I's dotted and your T's crossed when it comes to expanding your business in other states. Um, a big one that comes up often is when you're hiring out of state employees. Um, again, as a general rule of thumb, if if you're a corporation or an LLC and you now are hiring employees in other states other than your home state, generally speaking, you do not have to foreign qualify. You can register for employer tax account number and we can register for you on your behalf. It's called payroll tax registration services. We can do that for you in all of the 50 states. And as a general rule of thumb, there is no requirement to foreign qualify within those states. Um, there are a handful of states that require you to foreign qualify as a prerequisite. One of those states is Washington, another one is Oregon, and I believe Arkansas is another one as well. Um, Another big question that comes up often is, let's say I'm a business, okay, and I'm a corporation or LLC, and I've been operating as a corporation or LLC, and I don't really want to lose that tenorship that I have gained with my corporation or LLC, but now I'm really looking to move my corporation or LLC to another state. Um, that's referred to as business redomestication or often referred to as redomiciling the business. When does this come into play? It's when a business owner wants to keep the longevity of that corporation and wants to move the operations of that corporation from the state that and they're currently operating in into the new state. So if you've decided to relocate to a new state with your business and want to keep the business duration or longevity, a redomestication is generally recommended. Um, re basically, redomesticating is when you're moving a business from one state to another. And when completed, it no longer exists in that state where that corporation or LLC was initially formed. And now it's formed in the new state. Now, keep in mind, not every state allows redomestications. However, those that do have their own rules and processes. 
Um, steps to redomesticating for a corporation or LLC vary from state to state. Again, first, you have to check if your state allows you to convert out of your state and into the new state. If they do, great. Again, you can align yourself with a reputable filing company such as our company. We can assist you with all those steps. Generally speaking, if the state does not allow you to redomicile, then typically the steps would be to dissolve the corporation in that home state and start a new corporation in the new state. Um, benefits, again, of business redomestication or redomiciling is really it has fewer tax consequences. The company retains its credit history, which gives investors, banks and vendors more confidence in doing business with you because they see that longevity that the business has carried. Um, we have a bunch of tools and resources that are available to all of you. Again, check out our website at www.corpnet.com. Um, you can look us up through the Small Business Trends platform, or you can come directly to the corpnet.com website. We have a plethora of tools. We have a plethora of content for you and lots of lots of freebies and free tools that you can um, get yourself acclimated to so that it can help you at every stage of your business building process, whether it's starting a business, maintaining your business, or if you're trying to close down a business or just simply keeping that business in compliance. Um, we also have an amazing partner program whereby uh, as a business owner, you can partner with us and offer business formation and corporate compliance services to your clients in any of the 50 states. Um, you retain your clients, you retain your brand while we do all the work. Our partner program is free of charge. There's no setup fees, there's no annual fees. You get to offer a service and add an additional stream of revenue to your practice um, while we do all the legwork and the back work for you and you get to make money. Um, you can either become a white label, private label reseller with our company or simply refer um, your clients to us and get a commission on each sale. With that said, I'm gonna hand over the webinar back to Anita. Okay. Hey, that was great information, Nellie. A Thank very, you. Uh, Lots and lots of information. We've got some questions I want to go over, but first I do want to point out, again, we've got a discount here. So if you'd like any of the services that <clears throat> Nellie has talked about, this applies to everything, correct, Nellie? Yes, everything. It's 10% off our service fees, off any of our services. Yeah, absolutely. So, so not like if the state charges a filing fee, you're not giving a discount off of that, but any of your service fees, correct? Yes. Unfortunately, state filing fees, shipping and handling is not included. The 10% is off any of CorpNet service fees that are being charged for the service. So, but that's a great deal. So thank you very much. Use the discount code SMBT10. Or you can go to that little short URL there, svt.me slash DOK. And uh, that is a shortened URL. Um, okay, let's, let's jump into some questions, Nelly. I know you've answered a lot of these things, but I wanna go over a few of them just to reinforce some of them. First, let's do a real quick one. Someone asks, you mentioned a franchise tax. Now that's not just for franchise businesses, correct? That is correct. A franchise tax is a tax that's uh, required by that state. Generally speaking, it's not required by all states. For example, California has a minimum franchise tax of $800 that corporations and LLCs are expected to pay on a yearly basis. So it's a state by state requirement. And when we're talking about franchise taxes, we're talking to any type of corporation, not only a corporation or LLC, that's a franchise business. Okay, great. Now, this uh, question comes from Martin. Uh, is it possible to register a business in a business friendly state as an international individual living outside the United States of America. So you've got someone who's a non-US uh, resident, non-US citizen. Can they incorporate a business in the United States? Generally speaking, anyone can incorporate a business in any state. 
as a C corporation or an LLC, even if you're not living within the States. Um, the question, you know, the only caveat with that is that uh, you can't elect to be an S corporation. But from all other aspects, generally speaking, yes, you can incorporate within the States, even if you're not living within the States. Okay, great. Now, if you are located in one state, uh, for example, New Hampshire, but you have an online business with customers in several states, do you have to um, do do you have to register in those other states? So That's you're an online business, you're you're operating out of one state. Does that require registering in various other states? Great question, and those are really the one -off, the one off case by case situations that really becomes tricky because again the question becomes well okay you're an online business but within the states that you're doing business in are you charging a tax you know where is the you know transaction taking place are all the funds being deposited into one you know where where is everything originating out of and where is all the funds depositing into so in those situations i would say it's a little bit more tricky um, generally speaking, to protect yourself, um, I would, you know, I would recommend you to talk to your financial advisor or accountant. Um, but if you really want to, you know, make sure your um, I's are crossed and your T's are, you know, your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, I would say as a general rule of thumb, you may want to consider foreign qualifying within the states that you are doing business within. All right, great. Now, here's an interesting little twist on things. Let's talk about digital nomads. So you are a person, you're an American citizen, but you move around a lot. You, you move from place to place, maybe internationally, maybe within the United States, and you don't stay long in any particular place. And you have some kind of an online business or consulting business or whatever. Is there a particular state that you would recommend uh, registering your corporation in? Again, it really boils down to even when you're a digital nomad and you're moving from state to state, even with digital nomads, there, there has to be domicile. You know, so there has to be nexus and there has to be established domicile. For example, you know, I'll use myself, you know, I would, you know, I'm, I'm in California, I pay those hefty taxes in order for me to take my corporation into another state, I have to re-domicile in that state and be in, within that state for at least two years, you know, so even with digital nomads, um, the, the question becomes, you know, even if you're moving around from state to state, they're going to look at the state that you're domiciled in, unless you establish new residency in a new state. And with that said, again, it, it comes down to, you know, forming the corporation or LLC within the state that they are looking at you as the domiciled state. Great. Okay. So my business expanded within the last few months, and now I have remote employees in other states. Does this mean I have to foreign qualify? I know you sort of, you know, you did talk about that, but maybe you could just reinforce that. So generally speaking, um, if you're a business that's a corporation or an LLC, and you are operating the business in one state, but have employees in other states, Typically, you don't have to foreign qualify. Our in-house CPAs always tend to err on the more conservative side, and they recommend that when you're doing business in other states, um, by having employees in those states, it's always best to foreign qualify. However, the state, when you're going to register for payroll account number and payroll taxes, um, unless it's a state that ha has foreign qualification as a prerequisite, they will not require you to foreign qualify merely because you have employees within those states. Great. Okay, how can I find out how much my home state charges to incorporate or create a limited liability company? Uh, well, uh, again, you can do all of this on your own. Um, if you wanted to just do it on your own, you would go to the Secretary of State's website within your state, and you could look, look up all those feeds. Sometimes it's really hard to navigate the Secretary of State's, and hence why you know, our company makes it so simple 
for you and you can come to us and we can do all the research for you and we charge a service fee and we can incorporate you within any of the states that you'd like to set up your company within and along with the 10 percent discount offer offered by small business owners it may be a good deal for you to choose to opt to go through a company like ours and that brings me to a somewhat related question which has to do with um, ongoing filings on an annual basis. Now you describe those different types of filings that you may have to have depending on which state you are in and fees that you have to pay and so on. What, what can happen if you fail to uh, file your filings and reports and your fees and so on? I mean, do you just get a slap on the wrist? I mean, what's, what's the worst thing that can happen? Is it really serious? I mean, it's really case by case and it varies state by state. Anita, ultimately the worst case scenario is, you know, you form the corporation or LLC to maintain liability protection, asset protection. And by not maintaining that corporation or LLC in compliance, you lose that corporate veil if that corporation or LLC is administratively dissolved by that state or goes into bad standing. So the worst, worst, worst thing that can happen is you haven't paid your filing fees, you haven't maintained that corporation or LLC in compliance, the corporation has gone into bad standing and God forbid you're being sued and now you don't have that corporate shield against you. So a service like CorpNet can make sure that you're always up to date on what you need to do because you're keeping yes. track of all the requirements. Yes, yes. So um, really by aligning yourself and partnering yourself with a company like ours, we help maintain your corporation or LLC in compliance throughout the lifetime of that corporation or LLC so that you can really focus on what you do best, which is growing that business, you know, going after new clients, going after new vendors and having us focus on making sure that LLC is ma being maintained and in corporate compliance by, you know, notifying you of tedious, you know, filing deadlines, alerts and everything that must take place in advance of its due dates so that we can remain, you know, we can keep your corporation or LLC in compliance. Now you mentioned privacy and anonymity. So yeah. if let's say I'm a small business and yeah. I have a home-based business and I want to try to keep things as anonymous as possible, aside from organizing in Wyoming, I think it was, yeah. what else can you do? Well, one of the biggest things is it's so funny and I love the fact that you brought this up. So people form corporations and LLCs and one of the quickest ways to maintain anonymity is to have someone like us be designated as your registered agent. We can even also um, act as your business address provider. So the more layers you have, the more onions, they have layers of onions they have to peel to get to you. So these are the ways that you can really, really maintain anonymity other than setting up in a you know, state such as Wyoming, Nevada, or Delaware. <laughs> okay. All right, great. Um, you know, we have a lot of other questions here, but I think I've hit the high ones and I know we're, the time is coming to a close. Are there any additional uh, comments that you want to make to close up? I just, really? You know what, I just appreciate you and this continued opportunity um, in getting to collaborate with you and your beautiful audience. And again, please, please, please don't forget to take advantage of this amazing offer that's provided to you, um, to all of you small business trends audience. Uh, again, the discount code is SMBT10. And you can type this into your browser or you can go to sbt.me forward slash GOK or come to our website and do SMBT10 at checkout in the promotional box. And again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to visit us at www.corpnet.com. You can send any inquiries to info at corpnet.com. We have life experts that are on chat right now. If you have any questions, you can go 
to our website and click on the live chat area and talk to one of our established experts or simply pick up the phone, dial 1-888-449-2638. If you're interested in partnering with us or want to learn more about our partner program, again, log on to www.corpnet.com forward slash partners. It's been an amazing absolute pleasure presenting to all of you. I wish you all continued safety and happiness. Be kind to each other and kill it. Keep shining with your businesses. Thank you very much, Nellie A. Kelp of CorpNet. And thank you everyone for joining in. The webinar is concluded.